All right, here's a sim on PPS sampling. PPS is a variable sampling technique. And if you hear the term variable sampling, it means we're doing substantive testing, not testing controls. Now, obviously you do sampling when you test controls also, but that's called attribute sampling. Here we're doing variable sampling and specifically we're going to do PPS sampling, which is a type of variable sampling technique. When does the auditor typically choose PPS sampling? PPS is performed when the auditor expects a low error rate as opposed to a high error rate. So a low error rate is expected and the fear is overstatement. So when the fear is overstatement and the auditor expects a low error rate, PPS sampling is often the sampling technique of choice. So let's look at the facts. It says Jenkins CPA is performing PPS sampling, also known as monetary unit sampling. So they're interchangeable terms on the CPA exam. Another word for PPS sampling is monetary unit sampling. So Jenkins CPA is performing this PPS or monetary unit sampling on the accounts receivable of its client Kuntz Corp. Kuntz accounts receivable is reported at a million two. So that's the recorded value on Kuntz's balance sheet for accounts receivable, a million two. And they have over a thousand customers. Now, Jenkins CPA's tolerable misstatement is going to be $40,000. What does that mean? Well, that means that Jenkins CPA can tolerate accounts receivable being overstated by $40,000, but not any more than that. And whenever you perform PPS sampling, you need to know the tolerable amount of misstatement, how much error the auditor could tolerate and still be okay with the fact that the account balance is fairly presented. Now the allowance for sampling risk, what we call the risk of incorrect acceptance specified by the auditor is 10%. What does that mean? Well, if you're taking a 10% risk of incorrectly accepting the accounts receivable balance as fairly presented when it isn't, if you're willing to take a 10% risk of that, that means you want to be 90% confident that the recorded balance is not overstated by more than 40,000. And these are our assumptions going into this sampling exercise. And these assumptions are going to help us determine sample size. So what are our assumptions so far? Well, we know that accounts receivable is reported on the balance sheet to be a million two. There's over a thousand customers. The auditor can tolerate a misstatement of $40,000, but no more than that. And they're willing to take a 10% risk of incorrect acceptance, which means they want to be 90% confident that the recorded balance of a million two is not overstated by more than 40,000. Now we'll probably have to determine sample size, but with PPS, before you can determine sample size, you determine the sampling interval. This is something you won't see with attribute sampling, but with variable sampling and PPS, the sampling interval. And you might have to calculate it, so here we go. If you notice, there's a little table above, above question one, and it says the risk of incorrect acceptance, if it's 5% and you're taking a 5% risk, then your confidence level to use in determining the sampling interval is 3.0. But we're taking a 10% risk. We're going to be 90% confident that the recorded balance is not overstated by more than 40,000. So that means our confidence level for purposes of determining the sampling interval is 2.31. So put a star there because that's the amount we're going to need is 2.31 because it matches up with the 10% risk of incorrect acceptance that the facts tell us that the auditor is willing to take. So we could ignore the 5%, we could even ignore this 15% because we're not taking those risks, we're taking a 10% risk. Now, how does this 10% risk of incorrect acceptance and this 2.31 confidence level, which comes from the table provided by the AICPA audit guide, how do these figures here help to determine the sampling interval? And if you get a sampling sim with formulas on it, like some students, may, although you know they would never tell me what they had on their exam, but if you got a sampling sim with formulas on it, it's going to look something like this. 
How do you determine the sampling interval? Well, you need this table. The risk of incorrect acceptance matches up with a specific confidence level provided by the AICPA, which means you will have the right side of the table given to you on the exam based on the left side. So they'll probably give you both sides and you'll have to know what to do with it. You'll have to know that if the risk of incorrect acceptance chosen by the auditor is 10%, then you've got to use this confidence level that matches up with the 10% risk, in this case, 2.31. So there's no calculation here. This is all given. Now we get into the calculation. How do we determine the sampling interval? The sampling interval is determined by dividing tolerable misstatement, which is $40,000 if you recall in the facts, by a confidence factor associated with the risk level chosen by the auditor. So this 10% risk level has a confidence factor of 2.31. So you want the sampling interval? Take the $40,000 tolerable misstatement given in the facts, divide by the 2.31 confidence level, and there's the famous sampling interval of 17,316. And I know you're wondering, what the heck's the sampling interval? Well, just know that we're going to use that sampling interval to determine sample size. So we have to first come up with the sampling interval before we can come up with sample size. So we just calculated the sampling interval. How did we do it? It was the $40,000 tolerable misstatement given in the facts divided by that confidence level of 2.31, which matches up with the chosen risk of incorrect acceptance of 10%. And we divided. 40,000 by 2.31, we got the sampling interval of 17,316. Now the sampling interval of 17,316, that's a function of the risk of incorrect acceptance over here and tolerable misstatement, right? First we had to convert the 10% risk into a specific confidence level given to us by the AICPA audit guide 2.31, and that'll be provided on the exam. We had to know to divide the 40,000 tolerable misstatement by the 2.31 to get the sampling interval. Okay, that's how we got the sampling interval. Now, what do we do with the sampling interval? All right, here's the same facts again. Question number two is going to say, determine the sample size for the PPS sample. And I'll bet it has something to do with that sampling interval that we just calculated. And it does. The sample size is calculated by taking the recorded amount for the population, a million two, and dividing by that sampling interval of 17,316. And that gives you a sample size of 69.3. But since you cannot sample 0.3 of an item, we round up to 70 items in the sample. So the answer to number two is 70 items for the sample. And since we're doing PPS sampling, the auditor will examine 70 account balances to test for overstatement of accounts receivable. So notice for a PPS sample, how did we determine sample size? It was the recorded amount for the population, a million two, divided by the sampling interval. And that told us how many customer account balances to examine for overstatement. All right, here's the same facts. Let's go on. If they wanted to ask you a little more about this, we'll go to question three. This is a true or false question with the same facts. If no misstatements are found in the sample, remember, Remember we looked at 70 items in the sample, 70 different customer account balances. If no misstatements were found in those 70 customer account balances, true or false, Jenkins CPA can conclude with 90% confidence that the million two recorded balance of accounts receivable is not overstated by more than the $40,000 tolerable misstatement. That's true. If no misstatements are found in the auditor's sample, the conclusion would be that there are no misstatements in the population. And if the conclusion was that there were no misstatements in the population, Jenkins could be 90% confident that the million two recorded balance of accounts receivable is not overstated by more than the $40,000 tolerable misstatement amount. Notice that there were no misstatements found in the auditor's sample. That means we don't have to project a misstatement amount in the greater population. All right, number four, same facts, true or false again. If no misstatements are found in the auditor's sample, the risk of incorrect acceptance drops from 10% to a lower rate. Is that true or false? 
Remember, the risk of incorrect acceptance specified by Jenkins CPA was 10%, and that helped us to determine the sampling interval and then sample size. And now we found no misstatements in the sample. Does that mean the risk of incorrect acceptance drops from 10% to a lower rate? Do we become more than 90% confident since we found no errors in the sample? Nope, that's false. If no misstatements are found in the auditor's sample, the conclusion would be that there are no misstatements in the population and that Jenkins CPA is 90% confident that the million two recorded balance of accounts receivable is not overstated by more than 40,000, the tolerable amount. However, Jenkins is still only 90% confident the risk is still 10%. What risk? The risk that the million two recorded balance is overstated by more than 40,000. That risk is still there. Why is that risk still there? Because we didn't look at any additional items. We still only looked at the original 70 customer balances. If we want to bring that risk down to below 10%, we'd have to look at more customer balances and we didn't do that. So that means we're still only 90% confident that the million two recorded balance is not overstated by more than 40,000. The risk is still 10% that the million two recorded balance is overstated by more than 40,000. Why is that risk still there? Because we only looked at 70 customer balances. Our goal all along was to look at enough items so that we could be 90% confident. 90% confident of what? That the million two recorded balance, the book value of the receivables on the client's balance sheet was not overstated by more than 40,000. And we accomplished that, even though there's still a 10% risk that the million two recorded balance is overstated by more than 40,000. We can't say that we're 100% sure that the million two recorded balance is not overstated by more than 40,000. There's still a 10% risk that it is overstated by more than 40,000. We can't even say we're 98% sure or 95% sure. The best we can do is say we're 90% sure. And 90% is pretty high. If you were to get a SIM or a question on PPS sampling, probably involve a lot of what we did here. Special shout out to Caleb for his contribution to this video. Thank you, Caleb.